For the Calgary Flames, it's all over but the crying. Your Locked On Flames, your daily podcast on the Calgary Flames. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Lockdown Flames. As always, I'm your host, Jess Belmosto, joined by my partner in crime, Nick Zararis. Nick, how are you doing today? Uh, It's snowing, but it's not sticking. It's fine. This is a fun time of the year. Everybody's looking at the standings every day to see where their team is. We're in the meat grinder stretch of the season. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to stick out the rest of the season with us or uh, enjoy the offseason... Yeah. Point and laugh. Yeah. Just uh, come hang out with us every day or whenever you feel like it, uh, wherever you get your podcasts. We are available on all podcast platforms and YouTube as well. We love seeing the comments and uh, just everyone is either on one end of the extreme. So, you know what? Just it, <laughs> let's just keep laughing and enjoying the ride to game 82. Tonight, they play uh, the Arizona Coyotes. And Nick, you pointed out a very uh, interesting stat before we started recording. Oh, yeah. No, the, the Flames are 14, 10, and 5 against teams that aren't currently in playoff spots. And that speaks to just... And, and that that includes being 0-2 against Detroit. That includes splitting with Columbus, you know, who's one of the worst teams in the league. Yeah. That includes blowing multi-goal leads to bad teams like the Senators. All of these things are reflective of a handful of a, a handful of circumstantial factors. The biggest and most obvious thing is that there is not enough of an attention to detail in pretty much anything the Flames do. And that speaks to leadership. And we're all operating under the assumption that there is a real leadership vacuum in the organization right now, which is entirely being smothered by the coach, where it's his way or the highway, and his guys get what they want, and everything from that, everything stems from that. All of the little things that everybody crops up with, whether it be the line combinations, who gets what ice time, who gets power play, which young players get opportunities, all of those little things, they trickle down from the coach deciding everything because there isn't an established veteran leader on this team who's named captain or fills that leadership role. There isn't somebody who puts their foot down when they're in the middle of a slide or gets the group up for these games. We talked about it on Thursday going into that game against the Ducks on Friday. If you can't get up for this game with your basically your season on the line against a team that's in the Connor Bedard sweepstakes, you don't deserve to make the playoffs, and you're not a good team. It, 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 we have tried our best to be optimistic to, hey, maybe there's a chance, maybe they get hot. They're not a good hockey team. They're not. They have talented players. They've gotten decent underlying results, but they're not winning games, and that speaks to a lot of problems. It does. And, you know, I think about just how bad that performance against Anaheim was. And this team cannot string together more than two wins. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they have. I don't I truly don't think they've had a winning streak this season in that again. Anecdotally, anecdotally, it doesn't feel like it. They've won three in a row like twice all year. They've won two in a row like five or six times, but they're not a very good team. No, they're not consistent. But is three in a row, like, do you even consider that, like, a true streak? Yeah, no, it's a streak. It's a streak. I mean, it's, it's not streak. It's not the Moneyball A's, but three in a row is three in a row. Yeah, but, like, it just, it, again, it just feels like that. It feels like they haven't been able to build anything for themselves. It's just, like, when you are playing uh, Super Mario... 64 and you're trying to pick up that stupid baby penguin and you can't because it it slips off the the ledge or you're falling you fall off the ledge like there's just no solid ground to build something on and that's very unfortunate because you know this team or I shouldn't say this team but Brad Tree Living invested a lot of money and time and effort into constructing this roster just for it to 
pan out the way that it has because of a coach and his stubborn ways. And that is a true disservice to these players. Everybody. Yeah, to everyone. I the stuff about like putting Jonathan Huberto on the right wing made no has made no sense. He it's not like he's a young player like Dylan Dubé who kind of has that versatility where he could play center or you know his opposite wing. Jonathan Huberto has built a career and solidified a career off of the success on his left wing. That is his natural position. Keep him there. If it's not broke, don't fix it. See, my counterpoint to that is that's actually Daryl doing something he wouldn't normally do. That's him throwing stuff at the wall and seeing if he can get a player who struggled all year going. I actually didn't mind that. I, I Conceptually, maybe abstractly, the way you've described it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to try somebody out on their mm -hmm. off wing for the first time in their career at like 28, 29 years old. But at least it's showing some creativity, some, uh, some recognition that this isn't working because as we all know, more or less... The problem with hockey systems that's different from other sports in like football and in um, basketball, where you'll adapt on the fly a little bit more, is in hockey and in soccer, every team has their one style of play. They all play one way. And when it's not working, the coaches don't make adjustments. They say, we need to play our system better. They need, we need to play harder. They double, they triple, they quadruple, they quintuple, sextuple down on what they believe in because it's, it's what they believe. It's supposed to work. So if you try harder, it will eventually work. The problem is the Flames do not have the players to play this style of hockey. They do not have the high-end finishing talent or the power forwards to convert on these high this lo these large amount of scoring chances and we were talking about it before the only st only one of the public models that still thinks the flames have anything beyond like a single digit chance of making the playoffs is money puck and that's cuz money puck very heavily values Corsi in its project in its game projections and the flames are an elite Corsi team they're top 10 all year in chances for and chances against because they shoot from everywhere with no real consideration of if the puck is going in, if the goalie screen, whatever. It's just about getting the puck on the net and playing as little defense as possible. That's great, in theory. <laughs> Eventually, if you don't put the puck in the net, you are not going to do anything. Hang on. I, I, because we're talking about this, I'm curious, and I have it up, the last thing I was looking at on the NHL app, because they're going into their game tonight against the Coyotes. I'm pretty sure the Flames are mid-tier in goals for they're 21st in goals for per game and they're 22nd in goals against per game and when you have that in conjunction with the strong underlying numbers of high chances for high expected goals for that tells you you're not scoring enough because if you're no. top five in chances but you're 21st in goals that's telling you you need to change the way you're playing you need to emphasize mm -hmm. higher quality chances you need to be looking for deflections and rebounds and instead we're still doing the same thing here and it, it speaks to a lack of preparation and not knowing what you want to do with these guys it, it, it's a lot of teams in the nhl have this problem where you can tell the guys are unclear of what their responsibilities and their assignments are or in the case like the flames they keep making the same mistake over and over and over again and there's never any correction there's never any teaching no. moment like even if something gets pointed out in the video room it doesn't change it guys on the flames have been making the same mistake all year rasmus anderson has had a solid season he still gets caught in between of do i need to pinch or do i need to drop a good two three times a week because he's kind of trying to figure it out and we are in march and these guys still aren't clear what their assignments are and it's really frustrating and one of the things i want to talk about in the next segment is just understanding assignments and how rules in systems work because yeah. a lot no one ever talks about this we don't no one ever talks about the mechanics of hockey and we'll talk a little bit about the rules within systems yes and before we take our quick break i did want to uh bring up this maybe not so fun fact but did you know the flames are the only team in the nhl to not have like a data analyst yeah. or someone that specializes in statistics and doesn't it make so much sense yeah no daryl doesn't believe in that no he absolutely does not but 
we're going to talk about the mechanics and the systems and just all that fun stuff in hockey because, you know, I think it's so important to actually understand that. And um, before we do that, I do want to talk about uh, our good friends at FanDuel. Uh, March Madness is here. You can head on over to FanDuel. <laughs> if you're not watching on YouTube, Nick just lit up like a Christmas tree, happy as can be. And now you too could be happy like that when you uh, become a new customer and get that no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus, bonus bets back if your bet doesn't win. You can bet on the spread, you can bet on player props, points, rebounds, assists, and you get uh, a lot of different exclusive bets only available on FanDuel. And you can check out um, FanDuel at FanDuel.com slash locked on to get that no sweat first bet. Again, that is FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Nick, before we wrap it up, did you make a bracket? Uh, I'm sitting down to do that. I, I'm doing our show now. I just recorded something for Liberty Blue. We're doing a Giants pod after I finish with you. After I take care of the Giants pod, because they traded for someone, they signed a free agent yesterday, I am going to sit down and do my bracket research that will inevitably lead me nowhere because there is no researching for your bracket. There is no logic. There is no, no. rhyme. There is no reason. I will be filling at least two out, though. I always do two. Well... Have fun and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. One time, I um, my homeroom freshman year filled out a bracket, and if we like came closest or won, we got a pizza party. I think I picked Duke because that was just like the most common sense answer, and well, <laughs> my we got a pizza party. My greatest claim to fame in in my long illustrious career of filling out March Madness brackets was having <laughs> Butler and Duke in the in the uh, Duke and Kentucky in the final and two not Duke and Kentucky Butler and Kentucky the in the in the year in uh, I think it was two thousand nine when Gordon Hayward shot the half court yeah. shot as time expired and I really thought I was about to have my bracket be, have the national champion right and the game right on a three <laughs> that from half court I was. The, the scream, the wail I let out when that ball rimmed out, you probably heard that it, You probably heard that on the other side of the country. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, you know, I think it's just fun. Uh, the men's and women's tournaments always just so much fun to watch. Um, it's a great opportunity to slack off during the week. Thursday and Friday, no work gets done yeah. anywhere in the United States. It's you terrific. Can, yeah, it's just an excuse to be unproductive. Um, yeah. Speaking of unproductive... <laughs> Let's talk about the Flames and their system because it's a lot different this year than last year. And I know that you are a big film guy, uh, not just movies, but like actual hockey film. Uh, do you want to break it down for us? Like we're five see, years old. I'm going to see how well the webcam can pick up my hand-drawn schematic. That's not bad, that actually. Not I can... bad. That's not bad at all. So this is what the Flames forecheck is supposed to look like. That's the defenseman recovering the puck with the X. The, the first forward in, the one in the middle there, is supposed to lightly pressure the carrier to try and get them to change sides either way as opposed to breaking out up the middle. And without that first guy pressuring well, this guy has more time to make out that first outlet pass. And without that first four checker doing their job, the guys along the wall are not being going to be able to cover that middle. And you've seen the Flames struggle with converting that pass. When guys have that first pass out cleanly, you have seen the Flames struggle to get back because they have talented defensemen, but none of them are particularly fast or great skaters, and they really struggle there. And when their four check was at its best last year, it was a buzzsaw. It was impossible to break out against. And because they had slightly more high-end talent, better finishers, better playmakers, they were able to do more with their scoring chances. They were able to, because they were forechecking so well, because they shot so much, they eventually it had the effect of wearing down the other team. Because the Flames aren't as good of a shooting team anymore, teams aren't as worn out because they're not shooting from dangerous areas. Those lower danger chances are inherently easier to make a play against defensively. And it's been a real issue all year for the Flames where they will do all of the work of getting out of their own zone, through the neutral zone, into the offensive zone, recovering the puck after dumping it in, and only getting one scoring chance out of that opportunity. You went the full 215, 220 feet of the ice, 
and you got one scoring chance out of it because the system rec- insists, shoot, shoot, shoot. It's fine. Just yeah. shoot. And that is a taxing way to play. It doesn't put as much pressure on the defense as it probably should because the entire point and the reason the analytics community harps on this is the more you shoot at the net, the more likely it's to go in. That is true. Mm -hmm. It's better off if you're a little more selective because the more dangerous your chances, the better chance it has of going in. The wrist shot from the point is not as dangerous as a tap in at the net front. That is the entire foundational principle of what the modern analytics movement is. Right now, the Flames do not have anyone who gets down low, can play make from behind the net at a high level, who can fire that cross seam pass across for the one timer that's the most efficient play in hockey. The cross seam pass results in a goal more than any other pass in all of hockey. We know this, the data bears it out. The Flames mm-hmm. don't have the finishers to execute that play, which no. is why they they have this volume-based approach. But this volume-based approach has real limitations, and you're seeing them this year because they don't have the finishers to take advantage of. So the way I always try and explain this is, yeah, expected goals doesn't account for who's shooting the puck yet. We haven't re- the math people haven't figured out a way to kind of individualize each shooter's shooting talent to themselves yet. Yeah. But you can understand that a better player is going to be able to make a more difficult play. That's what makes elite players elite. They can do right. things that other guys can't. Those guys, it's okay if they take lower quality chances. It's one thing if you have Ovechkin rip the one-timer from his office versus you have a defenseman rip the one-timer from that spot. Mm -hmm. You know that Ovechkin is more likely to convert that chance than another player because he's good at that. He is an elite shooter. Because the Flames don't have any of those elite shooters to make up for the the difference in the quality of scoring chances from last year versus this year, you're in this situation now where it's a lot of volume, but no quality. It's like empty calories. It's like eating a bunch of, it's like eating food with no nutritional value. Like, yeah, you're full. Like coffee. Well, coffee's different. That's an, that's an an, an important component of existence. I'm not going on without coffee. When the coffee bean runs out, I'm out. I'm not hanging around any longer when there's no more coffee beans. That, that is one of the simple pleasures I have every morning is taking that first sip of coffee and being like, okay, I can do this. It's not the end of the world. But yeah, no, um, I think one of the most frustrating things, just even just going back to the game um, against Ottawa. Yeah, it was Ottawa was the pure frustration on Tyler Toffoli's face yeah. when he just ding, rang it off the post. And I just, poor, the poor man. Yeah. It just, They again. all know. That's the thing. They all know the expectations were higher than this and they were supposed to be better than this. Right. And it's weighing on them. And all they're getting is Daryl barking at them. That's it. Right. And it's not their fault. It isn't. It's, you know, you can only do, you can only do so much. This is what got me blocked on Twitter uh, by Luch by saying that, you know, throwing your teammates under the bus when your coach is the one that's truly underperforming and not, you know, making adjustments. Um, it, I just, I feel so bad for this team. And it's just, it's not, you know, again, they can only do so much and go out there and do what (laughs) the coach expects. You can't go out there and turn water into wine. That's not, not in this system. It worked at first. It's not working now. That's great. I'm glad it worked in the past, but you had a lot of roster turnover and that's that. Not everyone is a cookie cutter student or athlete. You have to find what works for your team. And obviously, Sutter's system isn't going to work if you don't have guys who can go out there and just finish the job. Yeah, you you need high-end finishers to play this volume approach. It's the same reason, the same exact reason the Carolina Hurricanes have had a hard time in the playoffs the last couple of years is they also play this volume type of style where it's all about funneling pucks on net and trying to out-effort the other team. Yeah. 
Eventually, though, you're going to come against the team up against a team whose high end players are better than your high end players, and you've seen it repeatedly where teams like Carolina, teams like Calgary, they get outstarred in the playoffs because the volume approach is inefficient. Mm-hmm. The you need those high end guys who can make a play by themselves or f- yeah. f- set up a play to help out somebody who's less skilled than them. That's the, that's the, that this is the way to, to quote Mando. This is the way you can only do it. You can only find high end success in the NHL with that type. You need a requisite level of elite player to get, get into the door. It's like going to the club. You can't go in unless you have these thresholds. You gotta be wearing a certain thing. You gotta be with certain people. You can't get into the club right now. The flames do not have any of the high end talent requisite of being even a playoff team let alone a stanley cup contender no and that's just the unfortunate situation that they have found themselves in and again i think that like we've said from the start this is a matter of leadership this isn't the flames this isn't really the player's fault yes they get paid to produce but if you are not capable of producing in the situations that are Asked you have risen, you can't, you aren't going to find it's success. Yep. It's like if I go, if you go, if you gave me salmon and all this stuff I've never cooked before and say, cook me a gourmet meal, you know what? You're going to get McDonald's because I'm going to probably burn the house down. It's not going to work. It's a recipe for disaster. And um, <laughs> I think that about does it for this segment. And we're going to take a quick break here again And just wrap up the show with some more Flames hockey. But before we do that, I do want to tell you about a product that I use every day. It is how I start my day after I have, of course, some coffee. Uh, With AG1, I don't have to take a pharmacy of vitamins and supplements. I get everything I need in one scoop in a cup of water every day. You get 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. So that gut, you know, is it's good. And your brain health is good. Anti-aging properties, what more could you possibly want? And it is lifestyle friendly, whether you are paleo, keto, vegan, dairy, or gluten free, and it contains less than one gram of sugar with no GMOs, bad chemicals, and of course, uh, no nothing artificial, but it still tastes good. It tastes like just a fruity flavored water, really. And right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, and it just takes one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NHL Network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Are you staying up to watch the Flames tonight? I will be indeed, yeah. The Rangers play at 7. That'll end about the time the Flames game starts. I'll be, I'll, I'll be keeping an eye. And I'm, I'll be up watching the WBC. So, yeah. I'll, I'll be up tonight. WBC's yeah. totally shot, ruined my sleep schedule over the last two and a half weeks. Because the game always starts at 11. We're like, I'm still awake and I have energy. Yeah. And then it drags on to like 1, 1 2 a.m. And I'm like, well, it's 2 a.m. I should probably go to sleep now. Yeah, no. And that very much reminds me of... When things were, like, really bad and Korean baseball was, like, the only thing on. 2 a.m. Yep. And my timeline would just be like, hey. Everyone live tweeting KBO baseball because we were so desperate for sports. It's the reason I'm a car guy now. It's the reason I watch Formula One and NASCAR. Those were the only sports. It was Formula One, golf, NASCAR, and uh, Korean baseball. That was all we had in April, May, and June of 2020. Hard to believe that was three years ago. Yeah. That's that's wild to me. Yeah. And where does the time go? But I just I I know we talked a lot about um preparation and whatnot in the first segment, but to me tonight this they can't go in and us underestimate their opponent. That 
entirely speaks to preparation, attitude, mindset. If you are a team that shows up and knows your job, you take care of business against bad teams. That is often the difference between good and mediocre teams is the good teams, they find a way to get up for Columbus, Arizona, San mm -hmm. Jose, Chicago. The mediocre teams, they take every game, every game, they show up, they try their best, and that's it. And it, this it was something, it's really... I'm trying to think of how I want to describe it. Uh, so the idea behind having a system you fall back into is mm -hmm. that's your that should be instinctual. Like you know it based on thousands and thousands of repetitions that when in doubt this is my responsibility. This is what I'm supposed to do. But when you are a team that lacks an attention to detail, you get confidence issues like we've discussed ad nauseum this entire season. You start creeping your doubt starts to creep in. You don't fall back on your good your your practiced habits you don't fall back on your system you freelance you force a pass you shouldn't you skate you get caught on, in between on a pinch you break your rules like the entire idea behind rules in a system is if the other team does this you do that if they do that you do this the flames like most inconsistent and mediocre teams they're they're just going for it they're freelancing they're guessing what they should be doing as opposed to knowing what they need to do especially defensively where they haven't been as good as they were last year granted they have different personnel they lose a really mobile guy like kyle chillington who brings a skill set that they don't really have in somebody who's really efficient at breaking out of their own zone mm -hmm. which has been an issue for them at times where they've gotten cycled into oblivion by the other team until they make a mistake in their own zone and it ends up in the net whether that be one of the one many ones that's deflected in off of tan of this year we're just unfortunate luck but you keep getting cycled over and over again eventually something bad's gonna happen yeah no absolutely and i just i can't help but think of how different this defense may look if shillington and again this is not me blaming him yes exactly exactly like, what would things look like if he had been here it's one of those you know what if situations that you find yourself in in hockey, you know, whether it be like, oh, like what happens if Johnny resigned? Does Matthew stay too? Like, what's you know, it's one domino of those, effect, yeah, yeah. You just spiral out of control, and I think that the Flames are very good at spiraling out of control. I am so proud of them, like unbelievably proud of them for not letting that first period against Ottawa get to them to the point where they would be the ones losing five to one, you know, if the frustration was there, I get it. it. Very, it was written on everyone's face, but they, they still went out there, you know, granted <laughs> Backlund did have that little miscommunication with Markstrom that led to uh, Ottawa scoring, but it just, I felt like it was a decent game and they kind of pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and said, you know, what are we going to do? Go out there and play another 60 minutes of miserable hockey, or are we just going to at least put in a little bit of the bare minimum? So let me get in two last points before we wrap up here. Number one, yes. that first point, you, the point you just made is very important. At this point, this is where you see who your guys are going forward because the season is effectively over. It would be very easy for these last mental math, mental math, 15 games. It would be very easy for these last 15 games. Just phone it in. It's over. Whatever. Yeah. The guys who show up in these next 15 games, those are the guys that you want to orient the team around going forward. And then the second point. My suggestion for those guys to find a reason to get up for these games is very simple. Spite your coach who has treated you crappy all season. Go out there and play better because you can. Not because you should. Because you know you're better than you've played this year. You know the coach is part of the problem. Go out there and play in spite. Being a hater is a powerful motivator. You have, you all have a collective person yes. to focus against and be angry about. That's yes. who you get up for. You get mad and you sh stick it to your coach. Yes. And, you know, if you need some natural born hater energy, oh, just listen to one episode of Lockdown Flames. And we'll I get you have there. you covered. <laughs> yes, we have you covered here because it is just something so naturally and instinctive here um, because it's very easy to do. 
But you made a comment on yesterday's uh, Liberty Blue podcast about the Rangers and how you think they don't, you would think they don't practice because, yeah. uh, you know, they look like they go out there and just do nothing. It looks like 18 guys at open skate at a rink on Friday who are all <laughs> just happen to be on the same team. Like, yeah, the puck's going in that guy's direction. He'll get it. He'll get it. Do you see a similarity yes, there? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The Rangers do not fall back on their system whatsoever. They have 18 guys freelancing because they either don't care what their responsibilities are, the coach doesn't correct the mistakes, or they just they just yeah. don't know what to do. It's one of those three things. And I would argue the Flames, it's probably a combination of the system not matching the talent and the coach being stubborn and guys getting demoralized and get losing confidence and falling into bad habits because they're demoralized. Yep. And uh, that you could take bleep out all the Rangers right there and you would say that's the flames because it's true it and is. It, that is again just more fantastic mediocre hockey but like higher end mediocre hockey and that will do it for us here on today's episode of locked on flames make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast wherever you get your favorite shows leave a five star rating and a nice little review um we appreciate them uh you know, obviously the comments on youtube as well as long as you're nice and um yeah we'll i'll be here tomorrow and i'm sure nick will be back on thursday or at some point later in the week thursday you- i'll be here fantastic and you can follow me on twitter at just Belmosto and nick at nick zararis and Support your favorite content creators because we would like to buy more $7 coffees. Correct. And maybe go to playoff games.